crunchy time of the year of the day. It is Sunday, March 1st, 2020. And if you've been following me and you've been hanging out on these uh, long form Q and A chats, whether it's on Facebook or you're listening to this on YouTube, you may know that we're at that final kind of last part of registration for Smart Body, Smart Mind, for Smart Body, Smart Mind, also abbreviated SBSM. So I've got one question that was submitted between my last call and this one, and I also want to take any of your live questions that you have for me today regarding the work that I do online, um, what Smart Body, Smart Mind is, how it helps, the way the program works, um, if you have questions about our live calls, about the level of support you get, um, the sorts of people that we have within Smart Body, Smart Mind, lots of things you can ask me if you're still kind of on that fence and you're not too sure if you would like to join. I would love to get your questions answered, get any of your concerns or confusions answered so that you can decide quite soon if you would like to join the program this year 2020 with myself my team my alumni and of course the new members that are already in there getting ready for orientation week so if you do have a question post it in the comments i'm right here with them i can see them as they come up i would love to know where are you have you been to one of these chats before um is there something that you are wanting to ask, but you've been holding back for like weeks and weeks and you haven't, um, now is your chance to do this. Um, I would love to answer all questions related to Smart Body, Smart Mind and whether or not it will be a good fit for you. So um, whether you are a practitioner, a coach, a healer, maybe, maybe you are working on your own healing, your own um, wellness, whether it is for prevention or your in a situation where you are healing a various uh, chronic illness of the many varieties that we humans live with this day and age. Um, I might mention a bit of the research that led me to this work. Um, hey there, Elizabeth from Rhode Island. Thank you for chiming in and, and making me feel not so alone here. I know Crystal's here um, helping with some links and I see about 21 of you here right now. So if you are um, wanting to ask a question, do not be shy. Um, I will not bite. I can't bite over the computer. Um, and I want to really get any concerns and confusions cleared up so that you do not have to wait for another round. So another year and another year, a lot can happen in a year. And I will admit it can be a little scary to decide to take such a big leap, such a big commitment, such a big financial commitment, um, for our healing, especially when we have been trying so much for so many years, often a lot of my students for decades. We have people from all different walks of life and ages ranging from the 20s all the way to the 80s. And so this just shows that this work doesn't know any age. It is for everyone and anyone who has a nervous system, which is all of us. So um, if you haven't checked out the program registration page, page, please do so. Give you a little bit of housekeeping. So we're gonna start the program pop proper tomorrow. We start with orientation week. Now, this is something we added last year and it was a great big hit because it gave us a full week so that the, the newbies and the alumni, if the alumni haven't come into a round for a while, and I'll talk about what you get as an alum, um, but the orientation week is for us to get settled, for you to review any of our pre-program materials. If you have not gone through our healing trauma videos, this is a complimentary free training. I hope you have checked out. If you haven't yet, um, we'll link that somewhere near this video. There's no reason to not get into those videos if you haven't already. If you're interested in your nervous system and really taking it to that next level and healing at this level, you're going to want to check out those videos, whether you join SBSM this year or not, because that is like the bread and butter, the foundations. And I've got one of our handouts here. Each training video has one of these handy, handy handouts. Um, this is the one from the third video. It talks about what I call my unorthodox healing blueprint. It goes through the big stages, the big elements that we need to have in place so that we can properly sequence our healing at this nervous system level. There is a sequence and there is a reason for this sequence. And that is because 
we can't start with the most complex processes first. We have to start with the basics. We need to learn what I like to say, the one, two, threes and the ABCs. And then once we get our basics on board and we've built some foundations and foundations and foundations, then we start to discover more of our nervous system physiology that maybe has been kind of shut down and not in our awareness for a very long time. So um, we will get into um, these basic um, pre-program materials in this first week, which is orientation week. So it starts tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. is our first call. It's our orientation call. And during this call, I'm going to get into some of the kind of the um, the main secrets, if you will, the things to really land and think about when we get into this work. And I'll share some of them with you right now. One of the biggest things that I have seen can trip people up when they're beginning this work, whether it's with me or someone else who is a practitioner, is that we we need to see this work as a lifestyle. We cannot see this as um, I always use the example, like taking a dose of antibiotics when we have an infection. Um, that works beautifully for things like that. Um, the other example I also give is if we have, a, say, a broken bone or a cut on our hand, it is going to heal or we're going to get some help to make it heal, um, give it a little extra support. But then when that cut is all healed up and that bone has mended and we've done the right rehabilitation, it should be good as new, right? Skin heals really effectively and efficiently. And then once it's healed, we don't need to keep tending to it. Working with the nervous system is very different. It isn't something that we choose to do and then we stop doing. It's kind of like something that we decide we want to do. And then when we do it, we're sort of, we've crossed that path. We've gone through that door. I always use the matrix. If you recall the movie, the matrix, it's gosh, it's like 20 years old now, um, where they talk about taking the red pill and crossing over the door into the matrix and seeing what is really there. And in, in some ways, this work is very much like that. We are crossing over and really seeing with our own eyes and feeling through our own physiology what we have missed for many of us entire lifetimes. And we miss what is there. We miss what we have within the system of ours because of trauma, because of survival stress that we have had to live with to cope with our circumstance, with the unsafety in our world. And it's very important to understand, again, um, I know I sound like a broken record sometimes with this, but it's important. Um, we need to see this as a lifestyle, just like drinking water is something that we need to do every day. Movement is something that we need to do every day and eating well and brushing our teeth, something that we don't just do for a few weeks, then we stop and we hope that they take care of themselves. We have to continually practice this work. And so the 12 weeks starts with me tomorrow giving a little bit of a, a lecture pep talk on that. Um, and then from there, we get into our labs, which are our modules. The course curriculum runs from the 9th of March all the way through to the 7th of June. Um, it's That is about a 13 week period. 12 of those weeks are active learning. One of those weeks is kind of our wrap up week where we do the opposite of orientation. We kind of wrap up everything. Throughout the 12 weeks, just to give some feed or give some history of how this program came to be, I created Smart Body, Smart Mind while I was in private practice. So I was working with people kind of in the trenches with big, big traumas, complex traumas, shock traumas, early traumas, surgical traumas, anesthesia traumas, you name it, we were working with it. And it was really apparent to me after a few years that it wasn't enough for someone to just see me for one hour every week. And those were the folks that had the ability, the financial resource even to come in once a week because for most of us, this work is not covered under um, insurance. Um, we're free agents, just like many body workers are and health coaches are. Um, people have to pay out of pocket. And I was realizing that it wasn't enough for them to just see me for that hour. They needed homework. They needed exercises to do, it, to do at home. Just like going to the gym once a week for one hour is not going to give us 
good fitness, we have to keep moving and be active and find ways to incorporate activity into our daily life. This nervous system work is no different. And so um, over the course of years and obviously the months leading into years, I created audio lessons, video trainings, and long story short, that is what is now Smart Body, Smart Mind. Obviously, it's much more polished. Um, for those of you that have not heard me talk about how the program is laid out, you get a actual program website. So everything lives live on our secured, unique program website. So as we move through the 12 weeks, each week we add another module and then we add another module, et cetera, et cetera. So by the end of the 12 weeks, all of the course curriculum is there and we work through it step by step. Kind of like if you were to go to a university class, usually you don't get everything. You don't get all your lectures on the first week. You get your assignments as you work through that semester. I've created Smart Body, Smart Mind like that so that there isn't this, you know, we don't just throw it at you and go, okay, figure it out. We work through it piece by piece, step by step. So the way that the curriculum is set out is that each week we give you a suggested pathway for how to work through the four lessons. There are four main lessons a week. They could be an audio exercise. They might be a video training. It's usually one of the two. As we get into the fifth uh, lab, the fifth module of the program, it's pretty much all practical. So the very kind of that first third is 50-50 education practical, and then we start to skew it to be mainly practical with a little bit of education through the form of my um, training calls, which are like the live lectures. So we dose it out in that way. We give you a suggested pathway. And then one of the more common questions I get is, um, can I go at my own pace? Um, what if I need to pause? What if I need to, what if I'm on holiday and I don't have time? Um, and I'll answer, I'll actually address that in a specific way in a second. Um, I say you got to go at your, at your own pace. You have to learn how to re-listen to your body. When we have pushed so hard to say stay safe and disconnect from our system, we will often override, that's the word we use, we will often override because we don't want to feel what is inside here or we don't want to wake up to the reality that we might be living in. When we were brought up in a very kind of stressful environment where there was a lot of bad things occurring or maybe the people who were raising us, they were just not emotionally mature and sound human beings that could nurture us and offer us emotional support and help us regulate our nervous systems. If they weren't like that, as a little person, because we're super smart, even when we're young, we will shift who we are to stay safe. We will shift who we are so that we don't get into trouble. We will shift who we are so that we have to take care of our siblings. We will shift who we are to take care of our parents who might not be able to take care of themselves. That is a massive amount of stress for a little person who has emotional immaturity and is still not developed fully in their body, mind, brain, and how they interact with the world. So one of the hallmarks of this work is really learning to listen again to this biology. And this is something that shifts people in massive ways from the very first few weeks. When we can start to listen to our biological impulses, really honor what our system needs, this is the beginning of what we call capacity growing in the body. When we don't listen, our capacity shrinks because we're disconnected from it. It's kind of like if you stop listening to the body, it's going to stop talking to us. And what will happen is things will store within the system, within the cells. And then when we have these genetic predispositions for certain illnesses, that's when that stuff gets expressed. And the one thing that we do know through the research, specifically the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, if you haven't heard about this, I did a audio um, SoundCloud episode on it. Crystal can pop that up for you that might be interested if you haven't heard me speak before and this is all new to you. Be sure to check out the ACE study because this work is not something that I've just created out of thin air. We have seen the research show us over and over again through different nationalities, different cultures, this research has been repeated that when we have had early traumatic stress growing up, 
when we have been put in a sense, in a sense, in a in a situation of constant danger, and it doesn't need to be physical abuse or sexual abuse or lack of food or shelter or clothing, and even love, believe it or not, it can be very, very small micro traumas that occur every single day that even the parent often doesn't know that they're doing. Misattuning to their young, pushing them beyond their limits, not listening to their emotions. Um, a lot of the ways that we were raised, the way that my parents were raised, probably our grandparents, was very much survival based, especially because of the world wars, especially because of um, just the way that the world was back in the, in the early 1900s and of course before, and then into the 30s and the 40s and and if you know history, you know how things were back then. Um, and now, of course, we have a different situation with different traumatic experiences going on throughout our world. And the thing to know is that when we've had those early stressors, they don't heal with time. And so what this ACE study has showed us is that when we have been subjected to a lot of unsafety and a lot of bad things that have occurred to us or around us when we were growing up, over time, that added stress, that push of constant cortisol and adrenaline, it wears the tissues down. It wears the DNA down. It wears structures of the brain down. Our gut doesn't repair. Our immune system doesn't know how to tick over and fight the cells that are bad. Um, it can attack the cells that are good. This is what autoimmune conditions are. So it creates basically a system that isn't turning over and isn't repairing and recouping. So that's of course physical ailments and illnesses. So I wanted to mention that because there's sort of this other piece to this equation, which is what the science is showing us, the research is showing us. And then of course in Smart Body, Smart Mind, if I go back to that curriculum and how it can help you, you are relearning how to reconnect to the system and restore safety back to it. Um, so all of that to say, the program is comprehensive. There's practical, there's education. There are live calls where we are doing similar to this. Some of them are on Facebook, but most of, their, uh, most of them are on a secure platform called Zoom. It's a video conferencing software where you get a login and you go into this chat room where I am there. It's as if we're in a real lecture hallway. Um, you see me, you see your peers, you can choose to have your video on or off, and we, we do Q&A that way, we do our live lectures that way, and, and then the other education is within video format where I am teaching you with slides on my screen. Everything is recorded, everything is downloadable, um, and what occurs with our live calls is if you cannot make the live call, and this is one of our more common questions, is if you can't make a live call, that's not a problem. We download everything and upload it to our site. Everything is transcribed so you can read the calls if you prefer reading, you can listen to the calls if you prefer audio, or you can watch the calls if you want to see me moving with my hands um, and teaching in that manner. So you are taken care of if you do not live in my time zone a lot of our students are on euro time zones a lot are in south africa some are in australia new zealand asia so it's impossible to line up everybody's time zone and that is the beauty of the online space is you can access this learning when it suits you um, and you can pause take a rest go back to the material at your leisure there's no need to push and get it done um, we want you to get what you need so that you can start bringing more goodness and connection and safety to your system. And it doesn't help when you're trying to um, push too fast and do too much based on where you are within your nervous system physiology. So I'm gonna to get to um, one of the questions that was submitted on email. I'm gonna to get to that first because we had one and then I'll get into the chat box. So for those of you that are here, Thank you for being here. I see some questions that have popped in. Um, so if you do want to ask me a question, head in to the chat box and let me know. So this one is from um, Tiffany. And Tiffany, I'm just gonna have a little sip of water. Okay, so your question is, can SBSM, so again, if you don't know the brief, it's Smart Body, Smart Mind, SBSM, 
can it help with antidepressant withdrawal symptoms? So this is a great question because many of our students have been on some form of psychotropic drug for either depression or anxiety. Um, and we have seen people shift their symptoms and of course their, their um, I, I, we call them really syndromes. And talking about um, conditions such as um, depression and anxiety, it can be a touchy subject. So I like to say, that these are syndromes. And in our world of somatic experiencing, um, and I'll just define this so that we're all on the same page, depression, um, anxiety disorders, um, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, autoimmune, Raynaud's, um, RSD, um, all of these elements that we would classify as a chronic illness, whether mental or physical, we call them syndromes, which is um, what we call, it's sort of this fancy word for soma, somatization, it's a very big long word. It's the somatization of things that we feel in our body. So it's like taking a symptom, but then making it um, something that is more than just something that's fleeting and then it leaves our body. It's something that is kind of always there. I did a vlog on that a little while ago on how somatic symptoms pop up when we aren't resolving and healing at our survival stress physiology level. So all that to say, um, uh, there are many of our students who have come in who either have been on pharmaceuticals, they are currently on them. And here's what I say to this, because every single type of pharmaceutical drug is different. And I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a medical doctor, and I'm not a pharmacist. So I can't speak to the, the various types of psychotropic drugs that exist. Um, but I do know that some of the withdrawal symptoms can be very severe, specifically with the benzodiazepines. These are things like Ativan and Clonazepam, for example. Um, Zoplicon is another one which is used for sleep. Um, and they can be some pretty nasty withdrawal symptoms. So it's important to know that when we are choosing to go off of something, and this is just my advice from being a human being, seeing a lot of clients who have gone off of these meds, it is super important to have this be monitored with a physician, with a psychiatrist, with preferably a pharmacist, because they actually are the ones that are kind of the, the front line with this. And you gotta listen to your body. And from what I know, that it has to be done so, 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 I can't say the word so enough, so, so, so slowly. The titration is so slow because these are powerful um, pharmaceuticals. So the thing that, that's important to understand, SBSM is about growing capacity. It's about growing capacity, to, capacity, capacity, Tiffany, getting over my, fumbling over my words here. So growing capacity, and I hope you've watched the video number one from the Healing Trauma series. If you haven't yet, Tiffany, um, be sure to do that, whether you do that now or if you wanna get into SBSM, make sure you do that afterwards. But I talk about, and I'll explain it for those of you that haven't heard about it, this concept of a swimming pool. And within this swimming pool, there are all these balls, these beach balls. And I parallel that swimming pool to our body capacity to our ability to feel what is inside and to be with what is inside. And then those beach balls are our old traumatic stressors. There are symptoms, they are those syndromes. So if you have a cluster of beach balls together, that might be that anxiety disorder or um, th that what we would call fibromyalgia or a chronic condition. Um, and they're real conditions. There's something that is being experienced. It's not all in the head. It can impact the actual physical, physical organ, organ structures. Um, and so we have this swimming pool with all these beach balls clustered together. When we have had a lot of early traumatic stress and we've disconnected from the body, this pool is, it, it shrinks. So it's metaphorical, but it also is literal in many ways. So our system shrinks. And when we have all of that stress and trauma inside, it feels very intense. One of the reasons we disconnect and we go into a shutdown response is because it's too much to feel all that stuff. So the system kind of, it's hard for me to describe it physically, but we get really small, we shrink down, we brace our muscles, 
we kind of just numb out from everything that is there. So part of what we do, and if not all of what we do in Smart Body, Smart Mind, we work on practical elements, I call them neurosensory exercises, to reconnect, to reinvigorate, and to in many ways remember. So if we think about that word remember, we're literally bringing back the members of our body into our awareness. So when we think about withdrawal symptoms, from what I know, from what I've heard from my clients, I have not experienced this myself, so I'm going through what they've told me, the pain can be unbearable. It can feel like your skin is burning. It can feel like there's a, a, a crumpling of the tissues. It's very painful and the nerves are in some ways going into a bit of a chaos because it's shifting the chemical state that the system has been in as a result of these pharmaceuticals. And so this is where part of having really strong resources is essential. And by resources, I mean, it could be resources that are internally. Maybe it is, you know, that when you feel your feet and you connect to maybe the thighs and you give them a squeeze and you track that with your breath, that helps the symptoms come down a little bit. Some of the lessons we do involve breath, but not classic breath work where we're counting our inhale, holding and exhaling, or doing big inhales and exhales. We do a different type of breath work that is based on the Feldenkrais method. Again, something that I am trained in and that you learn about in Smart Body, Smart Mind, and you do the actual exercises. Um, breath that helps to open up the spaces within the chest, within the diaphragm, within the belly, within the lower back. And when we have really severe symptoms of pain and burning, again, this is just what I'm, I've heard second nature from clients who have gone off specifically benzodiazepines in a titrated um, fashion, so they're getting medical help, um, the pain is quite severe. And when pain is severe, what does the system do? It reacts to that pain and so it contracts. And when we contract and brace against something, it actually makes it feel worse. If you've ever had a vaccine or you go and you get blood taken and the doctor or the nurse always says, you know, relax, you know, relax your arm, because when you have um, an injection or a needle and your muscle is tight, it hurts even more because that muscle is contracting it's trying to get that that needle that's in there and so there needs to be a relaxation and then you often you'll feel a little bit but it isn't going to be the same severity the lessons that you learn and i'm not going to name every single one but i've named a few of them working with the breath um working with um we call it the joints and the diaphragms it's very much in the osteopathic tradition of bringing focused attention to parts of the body so that they have more flow and more space and more aliveness because again the more we contract against the body the harder and stronger those symptoms will feel and it might numb out a little bit at the offset at the beginning but over time that bracing that contraction not only does it hold that that sensation but impacts the other parts of the body like the gut like the diaphragm like our ability to breathe in and out for our heart to beat cleanly and without pressure. So another big part of this, Tiffany and everybody else here, is we're wanting to restore more ease and flow by bringing more capacity on board so that when we do feel things that are uncomfortable, we're not you know, screaming bloody murder to try to get out of it. Um, I'm just, image, I have an image right now of a toddler who's screaming and you know not wanting something and if we keep trying to fight them and trying to ask them to be quiet and we don't allow them to express what's happening um, it gets worse and so the body's symptomology is like that as well the other thing um, that I'll mention is that when we get better at listening to our system and we have a stronger connection of intention with it and a visual of what's happening we can work with a lot of the pain responses um, in intelligent ways by something called pendulation. 
And pendulation is a term um, that Peter Levine, the founder of somatic experiencing, again, something I am trained in to quite a high level, he has sort of coined and taken that word, pe word pendulum, pendulation, to denote and to teach a moving of our focused attention from areas of the body that are more in more distress to something in the body that is in less distress. And so if we can learn how to shift our focus to something that is in less distress, it takes the heat off of the original symptom, the original pain signal that is kind of knocking at our door saying, hello, hello, this is horrible, pay attention to me. We recognize, yes, that's there. And what would it be like to just feel the tip of your finger, to feel the joint in the thumb? I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, but this is how, if I was working with someone one-on-one -on -one and they were having a pain response, I would never ask them, just breathe it out, try to get rid of it. I would inquire with them and we might work with the body somewhere that feels a little less painful, that maybe is kind of neutral so that the focused attention stays on the body, but we're not disconnecting from the body. And I often show you my hands a lot because a lot of the work we do is using the hands as a vehicle to reconnect and reestablish that, that life force energy back to our body. And our hands as humans um, are, are super unique. Um, they're unique to us. It's what gives us our creativity, our dexterity. Um, and they're highly, they're highly connected to this prefrontal cortex of our brain. So when we are bringing our own hands into working with our own bodies, um, it has this interesting way of shifting things in the brain itself. So a lot of the Feldenkraisian lessons that you will learn in SBSM, use the hands, use um, shifting the tone of the hands, of the fingers. Because if we think about it, Often a withdrawal symptom, if you look at my hand, is, is like spastic, it's tight, it's rigid. And even as I do that, my whole body tenses, and you might even see that, like this kind of clawing response. I wouldn't want to do that for very long. It isn't nice, right? And so part of this work, and this is where the, the doctor, Dr. Feldenkrais, we call it Feldenkraisian learning, this is where his work really shines in Smart Body, Smart Mind, is I'm folding in those neuroplastic exercises into the theoretical construct of what Peter Levine's work is, somatic experiencing. And that is a practice too, but we're kind of tag teaming all these really good practices into one. And so part of the use of the hands is to find ways to shift the tone of the body through our movement, through our focused attention, through the joints, through the touch, so that we can start to shift the physiology to be less in that survival stress kind of on switch. And again, to go back to this, the concept of um, the reality, really, it's not a concept of withdrawal symptoms, is we're wanting to take the body out of the bracing pattern. When we stay braced, and this is for anyone actually here, there's about 23 of you here listening with me today, um, right now, chronic pain, gut problems, cardiovascular stress, not being able to properly breathe and get oxygen to our tissues and expel CO2 so that we don't have waste products building up in our system, that all comes down to having less bracing in the system, less tension, less strain, more ease. Um, and so it's important to understand that smart body, smart mind is literally reteaching you and reteaching your nervous system and the muscles and the cells and the way in which blood flows. It's reteaching the entire system to have less of that tension, less of that bracing. How we do that is unique. It's structured in a curriculum that starts with the basics, and then by the time we get to lab 10, we're working with much more complex movement patterns while staying connected to the here and now, to our physiology, um, and it's just a really wonderful way to work with the system because it kind of sneaks up on you. 
and often no one really realizes at the beginning how something so subtle can make such a drastic difference in the entire physiology and it's because when i teach through these lessons and you learn through my teaching you are layering in all of the elements of human experience so it isn't just about sensation and emotions and it isn't just about the survival physiology it is about our movement it is about our breath it is about how we see the world around us how we connect with the objects around us as well as the living things that are outside that are organisms and plants and forests and creatures and humans and babies etc um so Tiffany, I hope that's given you a little bit more insight. Let me know if you're here. Um, and then the other thing too is that when we are working with SBSM, we're getting to the root of why there might have been a condition in the system, a set of conditions that needed to create this level of depression for you. Or it might be someone who has a chronic pain syndrome or anxiety disorder. These things are usually not something that we're born with. We don't come out typically in these states, in these syndromal states. Um, some babies who are under severe fetal stress will come out tense. Um, and we see this more in westernized babies. Western babies, they come out and they're just these rigid little balls of tension. Um, and often it's because of the way mama, the mamas in our world have to work super hard and maybe our relationships aren't great and all the things that, that we have to do to live in this Western culture, the movement isn't there, the flow isn't there, the song, the dance isn't there. Um, maybe the old traumas that the mother is still carrying. All these things um, contribute to that stress response. So babies can come out with a high level of stress. Um, and if that is the case, then, and of course, this is what we know pre-verbal and early in developmental trauma to be. But um, a lot of that can get shifted by how that baby is handled. But of course, if the baby is handled by a mother who's equally tense and equally stressed, imagine taking your own hands that are stressed and trying to care for yourself with these rigid claws. It doesn't work so well, right? And so part of what we're doing here is we're not trying to fix the symptom. We're trying to work with the capacity. We are working with the capacity of the body to restore regulation back to the body when maybe that regulation was not even there from conception. And we know now with research that intergenerational trauma, which means that traumatic stress gets passed down through generations, um, I think the last time I heard Kathy Kane talk about this, one of my instructors and uh, mentors and colleagues, that it can be passed down three generations. My hunch is it can be passed down probably um, more than that. I just don't know if they found that in humans. They've probably done that in animal studies. So um, that's the other thing to know that when we work with this work, we're getting to that under that root layer. And so while you are building capacity to be with with these to be with these withdrawal symptoms not only are you building capacity to be with the symptoms but you're going to be by kind of default working at that core level that may have been what pushed your system to need to cope with a syndrome like depression like anxiety etc the one thing that i will say which um is often the case and I experienced this myself as I work through as I have been working through and continue to work through my stored traumatic stresses that um, were in my body and have been in my system even with solid regulation on board we will still have traumatic events stored in us that will start to come out when they are ready this is why I said at the very beginning of this chat this is not something that we start and then we're done in 12 weeks and then we're out. Um, we have found, I have found, my colleagues have found, colleagues that are older than me um, in their 70s are still working on deep traumatic layers that may be ancestral, they may be preverbal, and this is not to discourage anyone, it's just the reality. And so it's important to understand that where we are at least currently in humanity, most of us have not been brought up in a utopic environment 
where there was just one maybe shock trauma. Most of us have multiple things that we endured, world wars that our parents had to endure through, um, various other disasters that may have occurred in our, in our space. Um, and so to not sound doomsday, because that's not what I'm trying to do, I'm just trying to put, put the reality in front of you that this is lifestyle, this is lifelong. And if we wrap back to the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, through that study, we know that when we do not treat these, these survival impulses, when we stay trapped in that stress physiology, when we're revving at that survival level all the time, the genetic predisposition will express. This is what epigenetics is. It is the study of how the genes turn on based on the circumstance, the environment. It can be due to diet, lifestyle, lack of activity, but also being in this constant state of stress will make it such that the system, this is what we know, will shift into sort of that chronic predisposition that maybe was the genetics of our family, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we know that because of this work. So um, Tiffany, that was a very long way to say, um, I do believe that SPSM can help with these withdrawal symptoms just because it can help with pain and chronic pain. And again, you have to be smart, hence smart body, smart mind, smart in how you interact with the material. You have to know your own patterns. You have to know when you say no or when you maybe, you know, challenge yourself a little bit. You have to know when to ask for help, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it all comes down. To I believe believing that you can heal, deserving, feeling deserving of it, and then going at your own pace and really, really, really respecting your body. Hey there, Lyra. I'm very ready to fully commit this year. Awesome. Let me just have a little water. Hey, Frey. <clears throat> Wondering, here's your question, wondering if you are aware of an involuntary teeth chattering issue that's not related to the cold and it's constant and can this program help? So anything that shows up as that involuntary, it's like an involuntary chatter, it's not cold, that is still, just as when you go out into the cold and the, the teeth chatter or we shiver, that is involuntary or the hairs stand up to trap heat. It is the autonomic nervous system trying to do something to change something. So I'll say that one more time. If we do go out into the cold and our teeth chatter or we shiver or we shake because we're cold or we shake because we see something that's scary, it is that autonomic nervous system help, trying to help us. It's either trying to help us warm up with the shaking, with the shivering, um, or if it's something that isn't nice that we just saw, it's also the autonomic nervous system that's ramping up saying, danger, 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 get the heck out, run, fight, get prepared, get the adrenaline going, um, all these things. So teeth chattering, um, I've actually not had someone ask me that specifically, but it's sort of indicative to say restless leg syndrome where there's like this, um, uh, it's like a shaking response. This, the, the body wants to shake but it's not a trauma release, it's just this loop that the system is in. And working with folks and working with kids and adults and, and all sorts of folks, when you see something like a chatter start to happen when I'm working with someone, it's usually a sign that some form of emotional response is wanting to come out. Some form of expression is wanting to come out. It could be emotion, it could be words, it could be an old, what's called procedural memory. So procedural memory is something that the autonomic nervous system, it literally types up, danger, danger, you need to protect yourself from this thing that's coming at you or from something that's occurring or you need to say something or you need to express this emotion, but then for whatever reason, you couldn't get that out. You couldn't speak up. You couldn't run. Um, you couldn't cover your ears when you were hearing something that you didn't want to hear. And so if there wasn't the capacity for you or for anyone to get that procedure out, to move that out, it gets stuck. 
I use the example of a printer all the time. I've got my printer behind me, so it's top of mind when I'm on my computer. If I have my, if I have something that I want to print on my computer, I press the print thing. Still boggles my mind that this works. You press the print thing, it, it goes to the printer. It does it wirelessly, which is even crazier. So it does that. But then you know that time, those times where you, you're pressing it and it's not printing and then you realize, oh darn it, the printer's not on or maybe the connection's been lost. And then when it reboots, you go to turn the computer on and what happens? All of these pages start printing and you're like, oh shoot, I'm wasting paper and you try to stop it, but you can't. That chattering, that shaking, that desire, that, that, that anxiousness, all of that from what we know from the work I've done and the work that my colleagues have done, it is that procedure. It is a procedural motor memory that has been stored in the system for whatever reason and it's desperately trying to get out. So it can definitely be this teeth chattering piece, some form of survival stress that has been trapped in the system. So I do believe that SBSM can help because if we go back to the main thesis of it, we're building capacity. We're building capacity within the nervous system so that we can start to tune into the pieces in our body that have been denied. And if I use that printer computer analogy again, remember I said, did the signal get disconnected? Was the printer turned off? If we have been turned off from our physiology and maybe we know that this teeth chattering thing is happening, but we're not skilled at tuning into the rest of us, is there something in the gut that's firing off that chatter? Is there some kind of bracing pattern in the chest, in the throat? Is there an anger or an aggression response that's been held back since we were five years old when we wanted to tell our parents to, you know, go to wherever because they were being mean to us or they were being mean to our siblings or they were fighting all the time and we couldn't say anything and so we, we hold it in, right? And so the body has this really interesting way of storing these things and keeping them there. And then what's interesting because a lot of people will say, um, man, Irene, I'm, my system is just so safe right now. I, I've got a good job. I've actually got a really safe husband or wife. I've got great kids. You know, I'm healthy. How come all of a sudden now that all this good stuff is happening, all these symptoms are coming up, all these memories are coming up, getting these weird shaking responses. And the reason why the system will not process something if it doesn't feel safe. And so I'm not saying that because that's necessarily your situation, Frey, but there's usually one or two people who will fall into this category where things were going pretty good. They were, you know, working and doing lots of stuff. And then all of a sudden life got really good. And then all this stuff started coming up and the body works that way. It's not always the nicest thing to, to feel, but it'll wait till it knows that there's more support and that we can take care of these things. And that's why typically we don't see these things popping up until we get a little later into life. Um, luckily, I'm seeing a lot more younger kids, um, 20 year olds and even teenagers are becoming a bit more aware of this stuff, which is great. Um, and when you have a little more youth on your side, there's not as many decades of patternings that have been implanted into us. And so, um, again, this is for those of you that have kids or maybe you're young, um, younger than myself, you're in your twenties, you're in your thirties. Um, these patterns, when they're not as strong, they can be a little easier to unravel, unpack and shift. So Frey, I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into, um, this, uh, concept of the, ch the chattering. Carrie asks, Carrie, let me just have a little more water here. Okay. How will I know when to taper my anti-anxiety, anti-depression meds once I get into the healing? This is something that you have got to work with in conjunction with your, either your family physician, psychiatrist, or pharmacist. I actually recommend pharmacist in conjunction because they're the ones that understand these drugs much better. Um, so you need to do your research. You need to talk to your medical professionals. Um, 
There are some websites. I don't know, of course, what it is that you are on, um, but there are some pretty robust sites um, and groups for people who are getting off of benzodiazepines because that is a, a, a much harder um, pharmaceutical to get off of. And I cannot make that suggestion. This is something that you have to do on your own with the professionals that you find who are experts at this. Um, and then, granted, you know, you're here because you're interested in smart body, smart mind, to work alongside with those professionals that you can get the, the so that you can get, I should say, so that you can get the best support possible so that your system is not taking on more than it can. And I know, I know, I know that when we've been on these um, pharmaceuticals for so long, we want to get off them really fast. And trust me when I say you don't want to do that. Um, this is not something um, like quitting smoking. You hear people that can just quit smoking like that. And then of course there's the whole thing, well, is it all in the head? Um, this sort of stuff coming off of some of these pharmaceuticals, psychotropic drugs, this is not, that is not just all in the head. It is in the biochemistry. It's in the physiology, and so there needs to be a very delicate, delicate approach to this. So Carrie, I really hope you find the right support and the right people that can help you with this, and the support you'll get with SBSM for working on the other stuff, building foundation, that will be um, next level, because that's what we do when we're in program, when we're in session. Okay. All right, you guys, we've got about 28 people here. Thanks for chiming in. I'd still love to know where everyone's from, so let me know. Um, it is getting late here, or getting later here on a Sunday. Just a quick reminder again, that today is that final day to get in for Smart Body, Smart Mind. Um, that's my online nervous system rewire program. We run this once a year. Chances are you're here because you know about it, and you're here waiting to that last minute to make sure that I'm real and that I'm still able to answer questions and then you're gonna get in. If that's the case, that's perfect. Um, I understand how psychology works. Um, so just a note that this is the final day to get in um, and we mean that. Tomorrow we start school fresh, bright and early at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, so this is the time to get in if you do know you wanna join so you can get familiar with the program site, get your username, password, start saving things, downloading things, and putting in dates and times into your day planner. Um, so just a reminder, if someone's popping on because um, they've seen this live broadcast and they wanted to check out what was happening, we're talking about Smart Body, Smart Mind, what the program is and how it can help and answering your questions around the program. So this is Merete. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but I'm gonna pretend it is. Um, so you ask, how do you have, do you have any insights on where to start regulating the nervous system when you've been bedridden for many years. Yeah, and I, this is actually, there have been people that have gone through our programs who are really unwell and not able to move very much. Um, and I always say, if you are here and able to type into this device that you have, whether it's a computer or a smartphone, and you're forming sentences that are clearly legible and you're here showing up, that is the first step. There is a spark, there's a desire to want to learn and do this work. So a very large portion of the work is done laying down. Um, or I suggest if a person is comfortable laying down to lay down. It can be on a floor, it can be on a couch, on a bed. Of course, I always prefer a little firmer because that gives a little more feedback but something that allows your body to be supported. I will often say you choose if you wanna lay down, sit up, sit in a chair. Um, some people will find that they need to sit in a more upright position. I'm on a stool right now, so I have no back support. Other folks like to have more of a, a supportive position. So many of the neurosensory exercises, Marete, are, are done through visualization and using your hands and your intention in very gentle ways. There isn't 
big, big, big exercise movements where you're having to elevate your heart rate. Um, the one lesson that is a bit more upright, it's called potent posture, and that can be done in your imagination or it can be done sitting up and just feeling very slight shifts between forward and back. But that is one lesson out of 34. Um, the other elements are the Feldenkraisian lessons. Again, none of them are done standing up. None of them are done sitting up. They're all done lying down so that you have um, the sense of support and feeling contact with your back and um, the ground. And so that ground could be a bed, it could be a couch. Um, there needs to be a little bit of space beside you so that you can move a little bit, but the movements are as small as you can make them. They don't have to be these big, grandiose movements. It can be this big, really small. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be very small. Um, the bonus, there's some bonuses that you get um, that are with my colleague and dear friend and teaching partner, Ilya Marak. And um, his movement lessons, they're again, they're a bonus to the program. They're not the curriculum. They are a little bit more involved with movement, but he has given you, he will give you in them um, ways of adapting so that it can be done chair or standing up. So again, everyone's going to be a bit different, but if you are interested and you're curious and you have that spark to want to shift things and heal and get back into the body, then this can happen even when we are at that point where we are not able to move and get around and ambulate and ambulate very much. Um, and then the other thing, and we have this in our FAQ section on our um, program or on our, I should say, information page for Smart Body, Smart Mind, you got to go at your own pace. You have to really listen to the system and really honor when it says stop, when it says no more. And so boundaries are very important. Usually when we have a chronic illness, when there is something a bit more debilitating like an autoimmune condition, um, a neurological condition like say MS, for example, again, this is just an example. Um, we track the history and usually, usually not always, but usually early life wasn't that great. There was a lot of stress. There were high levels of trauma. We saw things, we were in things that were not good for us. And so often with that, we didn't have any boundaries. We d couldn't say no. We didn't know how to say no, because if we did, it, we would have risked more harm, more bad stuff. And so part of this work is learning how to have boundaries with yourself, with what you're doing. And I keep doing that with my hand, but it's a way of saying, you know, when you're in the work, listen to yourself and say, nope, that's enough for today. Five minutes is what I'm going to do. And if I think about some of our uh, students who have been very successful at working with their chronic illnesses and being housebound and not able to even leave their homes, thinking of one woman in particular who's in her 70s, um, she is now leaving her home and going on camper van trips with her husband. She never thought that that was possible before and she had tried everything. And of course she listened to her system. She realized I'm at a point where I got to do this for me. It's not for Irene. It's not for my husband. It's not for my kids. It's not, it's for me. And so often again, when we have lived the life of, of, of trauma and stress, that has created this situation where our system is so unwell and just really, really breaking down often, not always, but again, often it's because we never were, were put front and center. We were always having to put other people front and center. And then that's where our system starts to break down. Um, Gabor Mate's book, When the Body Says No, is a wonderful read. Um, for those of you interested in this topic, um, there aren't exercises. It's not a practical book. It's a theoretical book. Um, but if you've never heard of him, hopefully you check out his work. He was many years ago, um, more than a decade ago, I think by now, he was head of palliative care at Vancouver General Hospital here in Vancouver. And he really started to interview and talk to his clients and I guess patients who were not well and dying very young. And many were in living with debilitating conditions and 
it was traced back often to the inability to express having to do for everyone else and pretending that everything was fine when it really wasn't. So um, yeah, I hope that's given you a little bit of insight, Marate. Thank you for asking that. It's an important question and it's just really important to know you got to go at your own pace and really honor the system. All right, Rachel, hello. Are the stress organs, the kidneys a drink, a kid, let's say that one more time. Are the stress organs, i.e. the kidneys and adrenals, and adrenal fatigue something that are only um, addressed in the SBSM and not the 21 day tune up? Yes. So as a whole, smart body, smart mind, obviously is more comprehensive. There's more time, there's more content. That is of course why it is a higher price point of a program because there's way more in-person support. Um, and in SBSM, we work with not just the kidney adrenals, but how the gut works, um, a level of the heart called the mediastinum. We're working with the brain stem. We're working with levels of the body called the diaphragms and the joints. So there's a lot more in there. Um, and that is sort of the hallmark of what we want to work with when we are at this point of having what you named as adrenal fatigue or burnout really most if not all people who are living with some form of chronic illness and autoimmune their adrenals are shot there's very little left that, that those little suckers have been pumping out stress chemicals since maybe the day that we were born and they are just pooped and they've said i give up no more um, and so we get into these levels in SBSM through and through the 21 day tune up. There are not specifics for working with the stress organs, but the program, or I should say the self study course, the 21 day tune up, it's still building the foundations that are essential. And so, um, six of the nine audio exercises from the 20 or in 21 days, they have been taken from SBSM, but they are not the stress organ um, lessons. And the reason why is SBSM kind of has a synchrony in an organization where we take you from those base level foundations. I call them like the one, two, threes, the ABCs, and then we're building and adding and adding and adding and adding to the repertoire of learning so that when we work with the stress organ levels, you've got these other chops, so to speak, that have been built up. Um, so no, it is not addressed. And the 21 day tune up is still a very powerful program, um, self study. If you haven't done anything and you know that you can't get into SBSM right now, um, it's still a great way to start. And if you can make it happen because we are registering right now for SBSM and this is the only time um, that you can get in until next year around this time if you can make it happen Rachel then I do recommend it because you will have more than enough content and learning and exercises and Q&A calls to last you the entire year um, most of our students when you go in and I'm watching some of our introductions right now from our new members and our alumni because the alumni are in there too most will say that the first time they go through SPSM, they get to about the sixth or the seventh um, module or lab as we call them. And that isn't because these people are slow, it's because they're taking their time. And there's, there's so much in just the first seven labs that often we need a year or two, believe it or not, to work through the program. Um, so it's a robust program and I want everyone to have all the content in the 12 week period because then you can continue to work through that throughout the rest of the year. Okay, thank you for your question. Marete, I, I just answered a part of that about being bedridden. And as you said, um, you, f you followed up that you struggle with both, cr both crazy adrenaline and crashing and also being in crashes where I'm paralyzed. Um, also been life-threatening life threatening sickness during this. I feel like meditation helps a lot and I want to start working with regulating my nervous system, but I don't know where to start. And I get, um, I get too overwhelmed to read up. Thank you for any insights. Um, I will listen to the replay later. So 
just to kind of answer that for you when you come back or maybe you're still listening the if you are saying that you um, feel like meditation does help a lot then there's a very strong chance that the audio exercises that are in SBSM you don't need to read them you listen to them that they will really help to give you the capacity and the tools to lay down the foundations so that those um, you say you struggle with crazy anxiety and adrenaline that that goes up but then you crash this is a clear very kind of um, it's a clear sign of that fight and flight so the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system kind of at odds with each other one is 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 there because of past stress and it's trying to talk and it's trying to govern the system and then you've got this other thing the shutdown that's basically like telling that system to stop because it's too intense and both are kind of competing to be front of stage so to speak and so many people again this is just different ways that SBSMers have gone through the work and worked with the materials some will say that the first time they go through all they do is they just do the audio lessons they don't they don't do the extra theory they just do the physical practices other people will start with just the education and the theory and their systems aren't ready yet for the audio exercises so there's kind of this interesting follow your own adventure do you guys remember those books um, where people are naturally finding their own adventure based on the curriculum that I offer within SBSM. So um, good luck with your healing. And I understand that things can get a little overwhelming with this computer interface and social media. Know that the program is yours to go at your own pace. So when you press play on one of my recordings, you can shut me up whenever you want. You can press pause, you can press stop, you can close your computer screen down, walk away and let that sink in, right? Um, the Facebook group that is one of the bonuses of our program where we are in there with my team answering questions, that is an optional part of the program. It is not mandatory. For some people, they like that interaction. They want to see what's happening. They wanna be part of that community. I have met people throughout the world who I have never seen their names ever because they've done the program in their own pace and they haven't showed up for any of the Q&A calls, any of the Facebook chats, but they're kind of in the background just doing the work quietly on their own. So. There are ways to do this program in, in ways that work for you. There's no need to push and follow what everyone else is doing. Um, and of course, that's gonna bring up our old patterns of how things were in school and in our family system, but it's just really important to be able to listen to your own system, know what it needs, maybe experiment with a few things and then go, you know what, I don't like that. And that's what life is about, right? That's what becoming an adult is. It's choosing the things that we like because we get to when we're adults. Um, and that's an important thing to remember. Hey, Tiffany, thank you. I'm glad that you were here and you listened. I hope that was helpful. Hey there, Janet, seeing your name pop up. Frey, awesome. Glad that that um, helped you, that question. Hey there, Cosmia. Let me just have a bit more water. <clears throat> So your question, what about autoimmune disease? Oh, there we go. Such as uh, RA. So I'm assuming you mean rheumatoid arthritis. So diagnosed two years ago when I was diagnosed two years ago when I was two years postpartum with my son. I live a very healthy lifestyle. At times feel betrayed by my body. Feel like pregnancy and hormonal shifts and the stress of being a brand new parent tipped my system. Yes, this is very common. I have a deep desire to heal and live pain-free. I love life. Can SBSM help? With the way that you have worded that, my hunch is yes, it will help. Your, your outlook is very positive. You want to live pain-free. You do love your life. Um, I have no doubt that you have, you love your, your child. I um, mean, you know that there was something about that pregnancy and the shifts that tipped the system over. Um, sometimes, not always, I'm going to be general here, when we have kiddos, when our system goes into that parenting mode, if there were things that occurred during our 
birth process or even in our mother's birth process and there were traumas that didn't get resolved us is the current generation we get to clean up the mess and I know that sounds like why you know why are we the ones that have to clean up all of their stuff that they didn't deal with that's just the way it is and so not to sound harsh but it's the truth right and so we are left with this responsibility to decide do we want to stop the cycle figure out why this was overwhelming when it's something that is just natural that humans have been doing for millennia birthing babies and why is it that this tipped my system what wasn't that what was it that was existing in my system that was already at the brim and then this shift in physiology this shift in biochemistry this shift in all of a sudden being the sole responsibility responsible person for this other human life which is pretty big what has created this shift um and rheumatoid arthritis autoimmune condition cosmia these we have seen are linked with that study i mentioned the adverse childhood experiences study um crystal my assistant can pop up this article if you just look up chronic illness epidemic irene you'll find it it's where i talk about the ace study and i have a long laundry list of the chronic conditions that we have seen are connected to unresolved early traumatic stress and autoimmune and rheumatoid arthritis even osteoarthritis um, is connected to this so this inflammatory reaction which is what is occurring when we have autoimmune um, situations symptoms is the system is attacking itself it doesn't know right from wrong all it knows is something is over the top reactive reactive and it's attacking the system and so this is why for example um, when we have some of these illnesses we take cortisol we take cortisone steroids corticosteroids that cortisol when it's when we have it in our system and it's healthy levels helps to fight inflammation and you probably know this but i'm going to just give you everyone a bit of a tiny science lesson so in a system that isn't in survival stress cortisol has a nice kind of level of rising in the morning and then it tapers off and then it goes down at night and it helps to keep inflammation down but when we have worn out our cortisol when we have been again i don't know your history cosmia but if you were someone that was go 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 that really got a lot of a lot done you were really good at figuring things out and you're living was driven by survival energy that cortisol gets worn out so in other words that is produced by the the adrenals that are on top of the kidneys and so when we are producing so much cortisol not only does it poop out and our adrenal adrenals are left kind of like a dry sponge on the sahara desert with no more juice and vitality in them um, it also means that our system has been bombarded by cortisol which in high levels is very toxic to the cells and it shifts the dna it shifts the cellular structure it gets into them it's a steroid and so what occurs is that can break down the tissues but then of course if we don't have natural cortisol coming out our system goes into an inflammatory response hence things like autoimmune illnesses where there's this high level of inflammation um, same with uh, certain skin conditions and so that's why we use a steroid cream or why we would take um, a corticosteroid to bring those things down so let's rewind all of that to say when our system can get back into good flow when we're not living in that high level survival along with high level shutdown that fight flight and freeze when we slowly start to come out of that the part of our system that offers us what we call the rest digest cycle i'll use some fancy words it is the part of the parasympathetic it's called the low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic nervous system that's what we want to go into when we are resting that's what we want to go into at night when we go to sleep when we can have that low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic 
our system regenerates. The immune system does its job properly. The gut lining repairs properly. The cells regenerate. And the kidneys, the adrenals, the juices of the body, they kind of refuel and fill back up. The other part of um, Smart Body, Smart Mind, in addition to building capacity and getting to be more in that true rest digest state of the parasympathetic is working with the kidney adrenals, something that was already asked. And so again, we're wanting to re-spark and in re reinvigorate and also give the intention and focus to the kidney and adrenals that they can recover, that they can chill out, that they can rest. With that often comes this period when we're in this work where we might actually get more tired, where we might need to rest more, but it's not resting um, because we're shutting down resting. It is just true rest. Like my system is exhausted, I have to rest. And so this is another part of this work where we have to be very honest and respect what our system is asking. If we feel that desire to rest and then our old self says, no, keep pushing, 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 just do one more hour, just do two more hours, um, get this other thing done, let's go to that other whatever it might be. If we push past that, but inside there's a biological impulse saying, don't do that, don't do that, you shouldn't do that, and we push because our patterning says we should, that's going to hinder our healing in this process. So again, being very honest with ourselves, are, it's important. Um, and based on just how you've written this, I do believe that this will give you immense value and help. Um, and it would be great if you can give this a try. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more info, info Cosmia. Um, and for all of those here that are kind of feeling you know, this, I know my system can heal, I want it to heal, that is usually a strong sign that this work will help. There needs to be that mindset. I will admit mindset is important. Um, we have to want it and we have to believe that our system can heal and that it deserves to heal. Okay. Hey there, Rachel. Let's read your question. In a previous Q&A earlier this week, Irene had mentioned that someone who was likely experiencing shutdown for six months had begun to, had begun to experience anxiety while doing SBSM, and that recently herself, me, um, experienced a lot of anxiety from the nervous system work. She said that was part of healing. Yes, it is. Um, as someone with generalized anxiety disorder, I experience a ton of anxiety on a daily basis. Would I likely experience more anxiety, sim anxiety symptoms during SPSM and this nervous system work as well, or would I have a different experience? I'm worried about not having the capacity to experience more anxiety, especially in the context of S SPSM without a therapist present. This is a great question. So, and it's true, I mentioned how I have experienced bouts of, it's not anxiety that stops me from living, it's survival physiology that is coming up on my door and knocking and saying, hey, hey, we're ready to come out. So even on those days, on those mornings that I had a really bad sleep because I was jolted awake with my heart beating, or I was even on a call the other day and I had this, this flush of heat for no apparent reason other than maybe I was talking about something that was related to my own personal early trauma. Um, I'm still able to show up. And so what I will say, Rachel, is that what you'll get in SBSM, and I always keep doing this with my hands, it's this capacity building. There are tools, there are exercises that we teach that can help contain the system. And I, I do this because some of our lessons are learning how to actually contain the physiology so that it doesn't feel like it's floating away into space. And, and this is often what occurs is when we feel something that's too much, if we can't stay grounded, and I like the word contain better, but connected to the here and now, we have a tendency or we can have a tendency to rock it off into, as you would say, um, a severe bout of anxiety symptoms. And so it comes back to how can we reframe 
this word anxiety as survival stress and how can we reframe the experience you're having so that you can feel that experience without it ramping up even more. And this is a big part of the learning. It's a big part of the apprenticeship is knowing that we're probably going to feel this because this isn't something that just miraculously goes away. Um, I remember when I had my first bout of feeling survival energy, um, it was about four years ago. And um, because I've trained myself to know how to work with it, um, I can watch myself go into more if I don't stay connected, if I don't orient. And I play with it because I want to play with it so I can explain it to you guys a bit better. So I think in some strange ways, my system has given me those experiences as a gift so that I can better fine tune how I speak to you about them, right? And so it's this element of how can we reframe anxiety as survival physiology? It is old survival stress that is showing up and saying, hello, I'm here. How can we listen to that, feel it, stay connected, stay grounded? And then sometimes, Rachel, that survival stress has to come out in a way that might look like anger or it might be needing to run on the spot, not because I say to everyone, as soon as you feel this, you have to run on the spot. You have to feel in your system, holy shit, I feel like running on the spot right now. I'm going to do that. Or, oh my God, I, I feel this desire to just shake my hands, but there's no connection to what that is, but it's an impulse. I wouldn't say to you, I just want you to shake your hands. I would say to you and the students, you need to feel the impulse in your body and what it wants. Um, for some people, it might be cleaning their house. They'll feel this something and they're like, damn it, it's a mess. I need to clean up, right? And so I kind of say that with a bit of humor because people have said that they have been able to do things in their homes by using this survival energy in a positive way as opposed to just sitting there and festering in it and it just kind of circling kind of like a tornado and so we need to get very good at listening and listening to what it needs because it's not there just by fluke it's there for a reason and so your question is very valid about being a little worried about not having the capacity to experience what might come up this is where you have to go at your own pace you have to go slow and you have to really learn to listen and honor what your body is saying and wanting and believing it when it gives it to you. Um, and when we've been told for so many years and decades, when you feel this, try to get rid of it, breathe it away, tap it away, um, do something to shift it, we lose insight into what the system really wants to do. And so part of this, Rachel, is really honoring that and knowing that it is okay to get some extra support. Some of our students will still work alongside with someone else. I know sometimes the means isn't there to do both, but if it is, we say, if you can, there's no harm in doing that. Um, and then of course we have, you're on Facebook, so clearly you're comfortable with this forum. You can use the Facebook forum as a way of connecting. The thing I want to say to everyone, use the Facebook group as a way of connecting in an intelligent way. Facebook is not the program. The program is you and how you take the learning and the lessons and apply it. Um, so I hope that's given you a little more insight. Um, and I wish I could say, yes, this is going to happen or no, that's not going to happen. I can't do that. I, ethically, I would be, um, it would not be ethical for me to say this is what is going to happen because I don't know. And I know that when our system has more capacity, and we're smarter with our bodies and what happens in our mind, we have a much better opportunity at taking care of ourselves in the way that probably wasn't there in the first place. So hopefully that gives you a bit more insight. Hey Elizabeth, you, you've asked here, I often have sadness arise in my heart but no tears come. What is rising when this happens? I wish I could say exactly what that was, but um, the heart, and we actually work with the heart in the program. We work with something called the mediastinum, which is the sheath that holds the heart. It keeps it suspended 
which is why when we like go upside down and lie, it doesn't hit our spine. It stays kind of engulfed in this sheath called the mediastinum. What we've known and what I've experienced and my teachers have experienced is that the heart can hold both emotion of sadness and joy at the same time. It can hold dual realities. It's this kind of spooky thing, our heart. And so it's possible that a sadness is there, but it isn't necessarily going to equate to tears. And tears are not necessarily always sadness. We can have tears of joy. Um, a sadness can also mean that there is underlying anger underneath. Often, when we pick at these emotions and we really listen to the physical sensation, that gives us more of the clues. And so I would say, you know, if again, um, with this work and working at this level is we're looking for more than just the emotion. We're looking more, more than just the behavior of say tears. We're trying to fill in all the different levels of human experience, which could be emotion, but also sensation. So I would be curious to say to you, what would it be like to tune into more of the sensations and even the words or the actions that your heart might want to say or speak or do? Hey there, Lisa Marie. Good to see your name pop up. I saw you earlier today. You said, I'm off the benzos now. Awesome. Good for you. Um, still have aerophobia. I can never say this word, agoraphobia, and I hope this helps. Will this help a friend I have who has severe benzo, with, benzo withdrawal syndrome? Um, Lisa, I just answered that question a little earlier. So if you popped on um, a little later in this convo, um, go back when I finish and re-listen from the beginning because the first question that I answered um, after some of the basic housekeeping of SPSM, it was Tiffany's question. Um, and Crystal might have made a timestamp of when I talk, started talking about withdrawal symptoms. So um, if she has that, she can give you that time and then you can go and listen to that or let your friend listen to it. Hey there, Jerry from Minnesota. Oh, two people from Minnesota back to back. You guys should wave to each other. Um, Frey says, uh, jaw feeling locked and not able to smile and lots of spasms. So yeah, to go back to the teeth chattering thing, there's a, there's a strong possibility, again, um, this is just my hunch, that there's some pretty deep, deep old patterns. It could be emotion, it could be sensation, it could be the desire to say something and you never could say it that's trapped in there. It could even be dental work. Um, we underestimate how traumatic dental work is, especially when we were young and we didn't know how to process what we were feeling. Um, so that's something that's really important to be aware of as well. Same with surgical trauma. Um, hey, Tiffany, um, just making sure you're the same person. Yep. Um, have you seen this work help with feelings of guilt, shame, regret, and loss? 100% yes. Um, I talked about shame a little earlier today. And um, if you missed the call earlier, we just time stamped it. So if Crystal pops up that YouTube and you look for the words shame, you should find it. I'm not going to repeat myself because I answered that, um, I think, in a solid way. So maybe check that out. But loss, definitely. I'm thinking about someone who did our program well over three years ago. Um, and she had lost her husband um, quite suddenly. But they were older, but that doesn't make it any easier. And she was really in grief, super duper grief, um, as you would be if you lost someone that you still wanted to be with and they, it wasn't their time. And I'll never forget the day that she wrote into our group that she finally went through a whole morning or day without thinking about him. And it surprised the heck out of her because it finally showed her that she had, yes, moved on, but that she was actually in the moment rather than being in the past. And then, of course, interestingly enough to bring up your, your question about guilt, it did bring up a little bit of, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I just forgot about him for the day. But most people will say and think about it if you think, well, if that loved one passed, they would probably want you to move ahead and enjoy the roses and smell the flowers and move through life and be in the present moment. But to, of course, remember them fondly, 
Um, and so that, that just popped into my memory of that student who did the work, really got into it and slowly, slowly started to heal some pretty deep loss of losing her, um, her main partner. Hey, Janet. So good to see your name. Miss seeing you. We're old friends from when I used to live in Whistler. Um, so you said, I just wanted to say I was hesitant about committing to SPSM and I'm so glad I signed up a couple of days ago. Uh, um, you said this morning I found myself triggered and I was able to sense, I was able to sense I went into flight mode, which allowed me to slow down and acknowledge that I need to build more capacity. Yay. So I'm really glad that you were able to notice that. And I know Janet, that you've done a lot of, you know, you worked with me when I was still in private sessions with people and you've also done the 21 day nervous system tune up. And I think it's so great. And we've already had a few reports from people who haven't even started the course yet, but just by having the theory, they have stopped and paused and noticed the world around them already in a way that they haven't before. And that's not coincidental. It's because in the way that I teach, and perhaps it's the gift that I have, I'm bringing in the environment, even though you might not be aware of it by how I pause, how I look around, how I ask you to continue to feel things under you. Um, and so there is this interesting thing that occurs when we get this theory on board, it becomes more than just theoretical. And then we add in the lessons and things just grow from there exponentially. Okay. Hey, Rachel, it's okay. Um, your question was too wordy. I think it was fine. Um, I completely understood. Um, you said, well, SBSM, um, and healing my nervous system, increase my anxiety here again, it comes back to what I said. We have to reframe that word because generalized anxiety disorder, again, from the work that I do with Peter Levine and I've learned through him and Kathy Kane, this isn't a disease that we catch. This is something that is there because something in our history was such that we were not safe. And again, it's not necessarily because we had horrible traumas and abuse and physical traumas. It could be something as simple yet so potent as our mother being unwell when we were growing up. Maybe two parents who were so busy working their big business that they were not able to attune to you when you were growing up. It could be due to birth trauma, having had multiple surgeries when we were young. Okay, okay so there's all these things that put the system into this, what we would call global high anxiety. This is a term that we use in somatic experiencing. And it's this high activation that the system buzzes at. And it's essentially in a bit of a hypervigilant mode looking for danger because at some point the world was not a safe place. The world was a dangerous place. And so when we get into this work, our quality of feeling these things, they may become heightened. However, you know that you have anxiety. It is there. You probably are very familiar with it. What I'm interested in is how can you feel that in a way that's nuanced differently. And when you feel that, well, let's call it anxiety or the survival stress. And I already answered that. So perhaps this already answered the question. Can you do something with that that actually moves it to completion as opposed to it staying looping in kind of this tornado inside the body? Sometimes there's something that needs to complete like a movement, like an emotion. Um, sometimes we have to work at regulating the system at that kidney adrenal level, at that gut level, at this body level. Because if we think again, back to that swimming pool that I mentioned a few times, if its capacity is really small, we have all these balls and stresses in here, it's going to feel horrible. And so part of this work is building more capacity and maybe we don't shift anything at the beginning in regards to the survival stress, but when the capacity is bigger, it has more room to swim through. And so it's not being just concentrated in our throat or in our heart or in our gut. It's allowing a bit more space. And when we can do that, we can start to shift it. So 
um i understand a hundred percent the fear of feeling more and the question is can you feel it differently so that it can start to shift and take a different shape kind of like pain syndromes i can't say nor will i ever say it's all going to go away a hundred percent in 10 days 12 weeks one year and it might and it might not and could the relationship and how we work with it shift so that it has an opportunity to transmute and integrate into something else and sometimes that something something else is emotion sometimes that something else is a shaking response sometimes that response is heat sometimes it might come out as a rash this is what occurred in my system when i was healing so there's all these different ways because us humans are so darn complex that we emote and emit these stored survival energies um no problem rachel happy to answer the question um oops 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 okay let me see here i'm just going to check my phone to make sure there's nothing else beeping at me um so you say since bipolar 2 is considered to be genetic and lifelong is it a condition that you think can possibly be improved or even cured by working to heal with the nervous system through SPSM and or the 21 day nervous system tune up um i so i this is just me kind of not off the record i've seen some pretty significant things change in people this doesn't mean that something cannot be genetic and the question is, why is the genetic expressing that? Because usually it isn't like that when we come out originally and something occurs. It, you know, they'll say it tends to show up at this age. And I beg the question, well, why is it showing up at that age? Is it because that's when um, we're going into post-secondary education? Is that when we're having to figure out our lives and there's pressure? Does everyone that have the, that has the genetic code for something going to express that condition? Not necessarily. If you have ever read um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, when uh, the body keeps the score, he talks quite a bit about the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual um, for Psychiatric Illnesses, and in it he talks about how a lot of the colleagues that he has have looked at and many will agree that most of the conditions in that book in that manual are a result of some form of early traumatic experience that never got properly dealt with never got properly healed this isn't to say that there aren't true genetic disorders like blood disorders um, for example and so i have seen through working with clients who have been diagnosed bipolar um, for example, I've even worked with people who were deemed epileptic and they have stopped seizuring, whereas that has been deemed something that we just have. I think it's too soon to make a stamp in the sand to say this is how it is. And I, I know that based in my own feeling, um, seeing how there's been so much changes in how we treat people with, say, stroke or people that have had brain injuries or people that have had spinal cord injuries. Um, I've watched people within our system, within SBSM, who have been diagnosed with things like fibromyalgia and they have healed that. They've changed, changed their blood markers by being with their body and learning how to work with these stressors that are stored in the system. So again, I am, I am one who is hopeful even with all of the things I have been exposed to and expressed and seen and heard. Um, and there's something powerful, Rachel, when we believe that something can shift. I think we have to be realistic and we also have to have immense hope and potential and know that there is this possibility for something that perhaps we haven't even seen yet in humanity. Um, and I'm a firm believer in, in miracles and in things changing that we just may not ever think can change. And we already know that. I mean, talk to our grandparents who would never have thought that something like a plane could go into the air. I still am amazed that planes can fly. And so because of that amazement and that awe, um, even copy and paste functions on computers, I still don't get how it works, but I know it works and it's bloody magical. And so when I think about that, I also know how 
complex our human system is. We have just, we haven't even begun to figure out how this brain works, how it relates with the universe and our mind and our chemicals and our physiology. So um, I'm all for knowing that a lot can change and a lot can happen. And we have to do the work. We have to be patient. We have to do this in our own time. We have to know that it is going to take time. It's not going to be a miracle cure. Um, but again, as I've read through and met students who have shifted things that they thought would never change, um, I've seen some pretty miraculous things change. Um, and yes, birth trauma, pre-birth trauma. You ask, can this program help with that? Yes, to me it's all the same pieces because whether we had a birth trauma, a shock trauma, our mothers were traumatized, our generation were tra was traumatized, whether we had a surgery, etc. This is base level. We're learning how to be with our physiology in a way that at this point, as adults, there's no school for that. This is the school for that. Um, and so when we work at that level in the here and now, we are, and I believe in the past, present, and future are all happening at once. I do believe that. And so when we are working with the present moment, we are impacting not only the past, but the future and how our systems will respond in the future, as well as the old stuff that occurred to us when we were in utero. Um, and then in terms of the calls, more technical question, um, the schedule for the Q&A calls, they are they are all over the place in a good way. And by that, I mean, we have them on different days of the week, um, different times of the day, 9 a.m., 12, and 3 p.m. Pacific um, throughout the 12 weeks. Our training calls where I'm lecturing are at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays because I need to be a bit more on it and sharp for those. Um, and again, everything is recorded, Rachel. Um, everything is loaded onto our website. Everything is transcribed. All of the video is recorded and all of the audio is given to you too so you can listen um, and a lot of people will listen when they're walking if they're just walking around their home um, as a way to just bring that information in okay great thanks for your comment there Lisa let me just scroll down I think we've covered it all no dudes today no, no, no guys were here for the evening. All, all the women, I think. Not sure. I can't tell. There's about 30 of us here. So um, to the women and the men, if you are here, um, young and old, interested, curious, and still not sure, um, this is my work. I was counting the years. I've been doing this work for 23 years. I started working with human beings in the mid-90s. I got really into working with the nervous system in 2004. I got really work into working with trauma in 2008. I was in private practice for many years. I developed this program because we needed a form of nervous system university. We needed something so that we could learn the stuff that just wasn't taught to us if we were brought up in turmoil and stress um, in environments that were unsafe. Um, and that stuff doesn't just magically appear. We have to do the work to bring it back into our lives, maybe for many of us the first time ever. And so if that is you, know that that this takes time. It's just like, and I always say this, I'll say it one more time, it's like learning a second language as an adult. You can't do that one hour a week. You need to do little bits over time, over weeks, over months, over years. The program is set for 12 weeks. We're in session for 12 weeks, 14 actually when you count orientation week and wrap up week, but it's about three months. At the end of that time, because as a member, SBSM member, you have the program for life, you can continue to work through that material throughout the year. When we run again next year, you are invited to come back as an alumni, you get to join the calls. Any new content I create, and I usually create something new and I improve things, is yours free of charge. So the investment, while it is a bigger chunk of money, it is something that will be spread out for the rest of your life and it'll benefit not only yourself, but if you have babies, if you have grandchildren, if you work with people, if you just wanna be a really good human and help those that are in need, 
just by having yourself attuned to your own nervous system, you shift how you interact with the world in general. Another interesting byproduct of this, if you are someone who does not know how to take care of plants, last year we had a little bit of a joke on one of our Facebook threads, but it was damn serious. People were noticing that they used to kill plants and not be able to take care of plants. Now their plants are thriving. And that is not a coincidence. It is because that plant is a living human, not human, a living organism that needs good energy. And when we can attune to other creatures and other organisms, whether animal or plant or earth or whatever you want to call them, we can help them better. I thought that was the coolest thing is someone posted on our site, um, on our Facebook group, all these plants that were thriving. And they said, up until this course, I could not keep a plant alive, you know, at all. That to me is really exciting because our planet is in need of support. Not only do we need support, but our planet needs support. So when we are more regulated, when we are healthier, when we know how to feel into our system, we know how to help the other systems that are out there. Our capacity for empathy changes, our capacity to know what someone needs changes, and of course, most importantly, ourselves. So if you're someone who wants to have plants and you haven't been able to keep them alive, you'll be able to. My assistant, Crystal, is laughing because that woman has become a plant lady. She still loves her kids, but she has plants. She was never able to keep them. Um, and Crystal hasn't even done the course. She's just here helping me facilitate the course. So that shows how powerful being in this energy field is. Um, I'm a firm believer in Star Wars. The force is strong in our community, and it's the force of good. It's the force of healing. It's the force of education and it's the force of really becoming our own medicine. So again, we're coming up to about six o'clock here Pacific time. We only have another uh, half, uh, another six hours or so. If I got my math right there for you to join, um, we start bright and early tomorrow morning with orientation at 11 a.m. Of course, like all of the calls, it is recorded if you cannot make it live, not to worry. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for showing up. If you've been to many of these Q&A calls, I hope this has given you some hope, some understanding into why we struggle with so much stuff. Um, and this is a really powerful program. It's not our first rodeo. This is the ninth time we've run this program. We have had people from 47 different countries move through this curriculum. This is for everyone and it is a commitment. It's an investment. And if you feel like joining and becoming part of this curriculum in this community, get in there, um, join, and we will see you maybe tomorrow morning for orientation week. All right, everyone, Mwah. lots of love, lots of healing and lots of goodness to you. And we will see you maybe in the hallways of SBSM really, really soon. Bye for now.